You've got this new book out, Pride Comes Before the Fall. Great book. Right. Great timing in particular. It, it's designed to coincide with Pride Month, and you point out correctly, hello, Pride is actually a sin, not something to be celebrated for a month or a season. Well, it, 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 you're, you're right. In fact, it's the, it's the deadliest of the, dev, of the seven deadly sins. Uh, I like to say that, um, you know, gluttony and greed is, is bad, and, and, and sloth, wrath, envy, and lust is uh, not something you want to teach your kids, but pride is the pregnant mother that gives birth to all other forms of evil. And uh, pride is ultimately about self. It separates us from other people. Pride separates us from God. And what I think we want to teach our kids is how to be humble and kind, how to put others before themselves. And that's really what the book is all about. It's not an anti-gay book. It's not an anti-LGBTQ um, uh, community book. It's just saying... Look, if you really want to have relationships and a world that is thriving and being blessed and protected, go with humility, not pride. It's, it is a terrible message and it has to be stopped. I can see why the library ladies are very mad at you. <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah, that cannot I, be allowed. I know. And so they're attempting to uh, keep these books out of libraries and, and falsely characterizing the book or me or or just concerned Americans who love God and love their family and their country as being bigots or being haters. But it's, it's interesting. The people who are screaming the loudest uh, about book banning, like uh, the pornographic books that they're wanting to keep in the libraries and, and they don't want them banned, they're actually the same people who are the most intent on banning books. Yes. It's just the books that they don't like, books about faith, hope, and love. That's exactly right. I, I We'll talk about it in one second. I want to tell you, I've got another one for you. For your second edition, you can do one on, on Envy. And uh, you could base it potentially on this story I was telling my little guy uh, about a month ago. I was talking to him in, and he's like, tell me a story. So I said, okay. And, you know, you just make something up on the spot. And uh, my story was about this little boy who was desperate to make the basketball team. And he knew that there were better play players on the team. And so he intentionally sabotaged them. Like he, he threw little like sort of uh, little pellets through their basketballs. He threw marbles on the, on the basketball court so that they'd slip and fall. Mm. He undermined them. And you know what happened? He didn't make the team and it didn't work out for him. Then the next season he tried out again and he had gotten no better. He hadn't practiced. He hadn't worked on his own game, but he tried once again to hurt the other players. And once again, it didn't work out for him. So the third season he went back, he practiced, he worked hard, he supported the other players. And I said to my little Thatcher, and do you think he made the team? And Thatcher said, yes. And I said, no, he didn't, because this is a just world in which you don't get to make <laughs> up for all your past sins just by one season of being good. <laughs> you have to be good all the time. You always have to try for it. Change of heart is good, but it's not going to solve everything in your life. Envy is an evil sin too. Well, that's so great, Megan. What, what, a, what a great mom you are to be able to talk about these things with your kids. And isn't that what we want is we want open discussion. We want, we want intelligent discourse so that we can discuss things like uh, COVID protocol. What should the medical industry really be recommending for the world when it comes to something like this? Let everybody talk. Don't cancel them. Don't censor them. Don't ban books that parents want to read to their children about the history of our country and about what makes families flourish. Uh, that is exactly what we're asking for. Um, and when you have these higher up elites on the far left side who are openly censoring and encouraging libraries to break the law, you say that something has gone very wrong here. And we need to get back to the values that you're talking about so that we, the people, as the sovereign of this country, can move forward in a healthy, positive direction. It's so sad when, when we're coming off a month in which we saw, I mean, truly, I know I sound 200 when I use this word, but debauchery on the streets of America in front of children, corner by corner, shoved in our faces, on the news every night. And now you come up with something that talks about a recognized sin and how to overcome it, how to reject it. It's an uplifting story. Um, it's too offensive to make the public library. And then you try to organize one day, it's August 5th, in which others across the country could go into their public library and have a reading of such a book. It doesn't have to be yours. Of whatever could be books, yours. And really, what could be right. any book you want. 
any book of virtue. And this is what's so offended the American Libraries Association that, as you point out, the ALA director um, has decided that they need to stop you. And here's just a little bit of how she suggested it be done. Sot 7. We're seeing groups that seek seek to censor LGBTQA materials or disparage or silence LGBTQA library users, um, exploit the open nature of a public library to advance their agendas. For example, right now, um, Brave Books and Kirk Cameron are con- conducting a campaign to take over libraries on August 5th. The First Amendment does not require <laughs> the library to even offer meeting room spaces. So this in regard to the Kirk Cameron thing, you are not obligated to offer public meeting room spaces or invite the public in to use the library. You can have a make a priority for library sponsored programs. And what if your library decided to offer a whole host of programs in its meeting room on August 5th, making it unavailable for the public? That's uh, uh, another uh, option for you. That is unbelievable. What, what, what if, what if <laughs> your library happened to have other programs making it unavailable for them to come to your library? So this is all about keeping control of the libraries in the hands of librarians. And the way you do that is by making up things that aren't there to block families from reserving a reading room for their own kids. <sighs> Oh, my gosh. Isn't this wonderful? Megan, this is so great. She just brought up the First Amendment saying it doesn't require you to offer meeting spaces. I have a copy of the Constitution right here. The First Amendment actually says Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise of that religion or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people to peaceably assemble. That's precisely what she's recommending local libraries do is block people from peacefully assembling in a public library to speak about and exercise their sincerely held values about loving God and loving their community. She she said like pretty much every piece of the First Amendment. (laughs) And what's so great about this is it, it pulls back the curtain and it shows you that the great wizard that is got all these signs and wonders and powers and all these things that is scaring everybody and making them think he's so powerful is is really a, a group of people who are breaking their own laws. I mean, their stated purpose at the ALA is to protect the rights of all people to have access to information regardless of their views. That's what the drag queen stories are all about. Mm-hmm, Except, right. of course, that's precisely what they're not doing when it comes to people like you or me or millions of others who want to talk to their kids about faith, hope, and love. So my question to the ALA is, guys, why all the hate? I thought I thought this was supposed to be, I thought I just learned the rules. It's about diversity. It's about equity. It's about inclusion. Why are you excluding us? You did the tough thing during COVID. You paid your people and pulled your business through the pandemic. And now that decision to do the tough thing could qualify you for up to $26,000 per employee at covidtaxrelief.org. Think of it. It's a pot of money already allocated sitting there for those who qualify. Government funds are available right now to reward companies with two or more employees who stayed open during COVID. It's not a loan. You don't have to pay it back. The program is, of course, complicated. They never make it easy on you. But no one knows more about it than the CPAs and tax pros at covidtaxrelief.org. You don't have to pay a thing up front. These guys are going to do all the work for you. And then if they get cash for you, they share a percentage of it. Businesses of all types, including nonprofits and churches, can qualify. Even if you took a PPP loan, you could qualify. And even if you had increases in your sales. You did the tough thing for your employees during COVID. Now let covidtaxrelief.org help get you up to 26,000 bucks per employee. Visit covidtaxrelief.org. That's covidtaxrelief.org, covidtaxrelief.org. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you like what you just saw, hit the subscribe button for more clips and full episodes.